afternoon, everyone. Wow. Good afternoon, everyone. That is so much better. Um, thank you guys for joining us for this afternoon's panel discussion on the quiet crisis, racial disparities in healthcare. I think most of us are very well aware that the, the, there is a significant disparity in our healthcare with respect to access to healthcare, how we are treated in the healthcare system, but also more importantly, even our participation in clinical research. And the reason why that is so important is as we move towards a personalized healthcare, it is important that our data, our information, our clinical experiences are captured by researchers and scientists to ensure that we have access to drugs that also reflect our ethnicities, our, our genomic differences. And so today we have three distinguished panelists that will, are here today to share with you their expertise and their experiences in trying to narrow that gap in the, in the disparities in, in our participation in clinical research. And so, starting to my right, we have Dr. Owen Garrett, who is a President and Chief Operating Officer of Bridge Clinical Research. At Bridge, Dr. Garrett has overall responsibility for clinical trials, health services research, and healthcare communications business units. Prior to joining Bridge, Dr. Garrett was Director of Strategy and Business Development at McKesson Corporation, which delivers pharmaceuticals, medical supplies, and healthcare information technologies. And Dr. Garrett earned his MD from Yale School of Medicine, his MBA from Wharton School of Business, and his AB in Psychology from Princeton University. He is, um, I should call you an Oakland native now. He's been in the Bay Area for 15 years and is very active and engaged in our community. And we're really excited to have him here on our panel. Next, we have Quita Highsmith, who is currently the head of our Alliance and Advocacy Relations at Genentech. And she's the co-lead for the company's advancement of inclusive research. Her team engages partners and represents the full pipeline and commercial portfolio with patient advocacy organizations and health alliances. And she works closely with the clinical development organization at Genentech. Prior to her role, Quita served as the commercial lead for Tamiflu. Quita's lifelong passion for patient inclusion, developing others, creating vision, and fellowship are well known throughout the industry. And in 2018, she, BlackDoctor.org and the Milken Institute of Public Health at George, at George Washington University honored her as one of the top blacks in healthcare. Let us uh, please join me in welcoming Quita Highsmith to the panel. And last but not least, we have Dr. John Carpton, who currently serves as professor and chair for the Department of Translational Genomics and the director of the Institute for Translational Genomics, Keck School of Medicine at the University of Southern California. Dr. Carpton's research background spans a very broad range of topics, including work in germline genetics, tumor genome analysis, cancer cell biology, and health disparities. Dr. Carpton has an in intense focus on understanding the role of biology in disparate cancer incidents and mortality rates seen among underrepresented populations. Most recently, Dr. Carpenter was awarded the uh, Amer uh, AACR, MICR, Jane Cook Wright Leadership Lectureship for his outstanding research in addressing cancer disparities, as well as in his efforts in developing the careers of minority scientists. So without further ado, I would like to turn it over, uh, start, get our panel started. So, um, and I guess I should introduce myself. Uh, <laughs> I am uh, an, an assistant general counsel and uh, associate director of the healthcare law in the healthcare law group at Genentech, and I lead a, an attorney, a group of senior attorneys in our healthcare law group that focus on a number of things, including supporting a number of efforts that Quita leads around inclusive research, but also a focus on uh, personalized healthcare. And so I'm very excited to be here. I think this is a topic that we all have a strong interest in, and there's a lot we'll be able to learn today about how we can all play a role in narrowing that gap in the racial disparities, and in particular, our participation in clinical research. So without further ado, I know the audience is very curious to learn more about your backgrounds and to understand what inspired each of you to pursue careers in this area, in particular, really addressing 
uh, racial disparities. I will turn it over to you. So thank you, Melanie, appreciate it. And thank you everyone for staying. So Owen Garrick is my name with Bridge Clinical, what got me into this. I always wanted to be a doctor since I was a kid. Wanted to take care of folks, make my grandparents proud. Although my wife uh, is a doctor, my grandmother calls her the real doctor in our family because she actually takes care of patients. Um, this is a therapy session partly for me too. Uh, but what got me into this space, I served on the advisory board of Bridge when I worked in New York and met the founder, a um, guy named Brian Stone, who, who's a urologist at, on, uh, on faculty at Columbia. And Brian would go to these um, uh, investigator meetings or meetings where all the doctors and researchers get together and talk about the study they're about to do in prostate cancer, and he'd be the only black guy there. And prostate cancer has been epidemic in black men for a very, very long time. And so he felt he wanted to do something about this or that and formed a company, and I joined the advisory board, and I haven't really looked back. All right, hi, I'm Quita Highsmith, uh, again, with Genentech. And for us at Genentech, really thinking about the diversity of patients, and when we think about clinical trials, in the U.S., less than 8% of Americans will ever participate in a clinical trial, and of that 8%, about 90 to 85 percent of the people that participate in clinical research are of European ancestry. And so very few diverse people participate. But as we think about the U.S. and the um, demographics of what's going to be taking place, by 2045, the U.S. will be a minority majority country. And if we think about California right now, 61 percent of the people in California identify as non-white. So it's really going to be critical for us as an industry to begin to think about serving all the patients that potentially have the disease. And so we were very fortunate um, at the company to begin um, going down this road for us to think about how can we as one um, partner in the industry start to think about diversifying. And it's, it's a multifaceted issue, right? It's not just um, whether or not Genentech has diverse people in the clinical studies, but it's certainly uh, educating the community about why they should participate in clinical trials, as well as educating health insurers to ensure that people who do participate in clinical trials, that they have the coverage that they need. So we're excited to begin this journey. Uh, we're still early days in it, but uh, really believe that we can make a big difference and an impact. Uh, thanks, and uh, uh, thanks, Melanie, and, and uh, everyone for inviting me and uh, providing the opportunity to uh, sit on the panel today. Um, so what got me started here, I think, similar to Owen, I was blessed to know at a very young age what God's purpose was for me um, and how I was able to use the talents and gifts. I just, you know, from, from you know, you know, from being a a kid, it was pretty obvious that biology and life sciences was my strength, along with, you know, of course, uh, growing up in the middle of the cotton fields in Mississippi, uh, maybe playing for the Steelers one day. Um, and uh, I guess after uh, moving through high school and college, uh, I had the opportunity to go to Ohio State and uh, get a PhD in molecular genetics and, you know, be one of the first African Americans to do so uh, and accepted that opportunity. And uh, the rest is history. Uh, but, you know, it was during my postdoctoral fellowship at the National Institutes of Health. Uh, we were working on a hereditary prostate cancer study with some colleagues at Johns Hopkins. And uh, we had, they had recruited about 100 families um, where there were at least three um, a men in the family, first degree relatives that had been diagnosed with prostate cancer. And so we're working through the study. And I don't know, just one day, <laughs> the question just came to my head. Um, I wonder how many of these families are black, right? I don't know if you know where Johns Hopkins sits in Baltimore, <laughs> but it's surrounded <laughs> by a pretty, uh, you know, uh, essentially an African American community. And so when I reached out to the folks at Hopkins, they said, well, out of the 100 families, two are African American, right? So I immediately ran to, you know, my supervisors, Jeff Trent and Francis Collins, and said, hey, this is a great opportunity. We could expand this study. Uh, and try to uh, uh, pull together a, a program to increase the number of African American uh, families and men in the study. And so I reached out to a group of individuals, um, the uro urological section from the National Medical Association. The NMA is essentially the African American version of the AMA. 
And so I reached out to some of those folks, uh, Ike Powell, and we flew them in. And one of those individuals was actually Brian. <laughs> so Brian Stone, Jerry Hoke, and, and uh, about 10 urologists came and we're able to pull together a national study with Howard University as the coordinating center. And we recruited 100 African-American families in two and a half years. <laughs> and so it was just identifying the right people, the group of people who really were passionate and knew how to get it done. And uh, since then, I've really been you know, pushing hard and really trying to understand the role of biology uh, in the differences that we see uh, in minority communities, particularly in cancer uh, incidents and, and mortality rates. So to, to just piggyback and follow up on that, so you identified that there was a gap, that we were not actively participating in these clinical trials. And because of your initiative and your drive and your passion, you were able to really move the needle in that instance. What more broadly, though, are some of the barriers to our, to our communities getting involved in clinical research? Why, and why should they care? You're asking me? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think. It's, it's a multifactorial you know, conundrum that we're dealing with. Um, from my perspective, it can be done. <laughs> it's just you know, bringing the right people to the table who know how to do it and providing them with the resources that they need to get it done. Um, I've been at this for tw almost 25 years now, and when the right people are brought to the table and resources are, are given to those individuals to get it done, we get it done. Uh, but for so long, you know, and I, you know, I say it and I really don't, there's nothing they can do, do to me at this point. Um, I say it proudly that we've been, you know, you know we, we haven't been brought to the table. Um, and the resources have not been put forward to address this problem. Um, I am happy, though, that, you know, Quida was with us back in the fall at the American Association for Cancer Research. Um, a cancer disparities think tank where we brought together roughly 40, 45 thought leaders in the um, uh, area of cancer health disparities and we are developing a, an agenda uh, to uh, move towards short and long-term goals to begin to reduce cancer health disparities. Um, and uh, so bringing the right people to the table, providing them the resources and the opportunity to speak into these things. So I think the future uh, um, is bright. I think we're moving in the right direction. Uh, but without bringing the right people to the table and without bringing the resources, um, it will never get it done. And so for me, those are the two major barriers. It's not that people don't want to participate, right? <laughs> it's not that there are fears, right? It's those things, we can dispel those things, but it takes the right people to design the studies in the right way such that we can get move those barriers out of the way and be able to uh, uh, move the field forward. So from, from my perspective, it's resources and it's the opportunity to come to the table to help design the appropriate studies to get it done. Let me, let me piggyback on that. So uh, to a certain extent, I, you, um, what John said is accurate. However, I do think, you know, my group, we deal with patient advocate organizations and there is still some lingering, you know, Henry Adelax, uh, Tuskegee, that is out there, but people who are, um, have cancer and if they get asked to participate in a cancer research, they're gonna participate at the exact same rate that others who, who have the disease do. So I think it is a little bit of, we do have to educate. And I, and I will say, um, you know, especially as we think about the future, genomics and DNA, and we're going to be moving to uh, a, treatment and algorithms and medicine that is gonna be based on the person's genomic makeup. And I do think there is some education that we need to do in our community. And I will just give a simple example, um, uh, clear. So you, you know that there is clear in San Francisco and, on, and many other airports. My husband did not wanna do clear. He was like, I'm not giving the government my fingerprint, my eye scan. So I was like, all right, babe, well, I'm gonna go on through. <laughs> I'm going to be at United Club. I'm going to wait for you when you get through the long line. He did that twice. He now has clear. But well, I say that to say we have to educate the communities because a lot of times it was like, well, I don't want grandma to give up her genetic information or her. I don't want them to run some unnecessary tests. But we have to be able to say right now, 
in the database, 81% of the genomic information that is available to scientists are, is of European ancestry. And of the other 19%, 14% of that is Asian. Only about 3% is African American and less than 1% is Hispanic. And when we think about what, where health algorithms are going, they're going to be making treatment decisions for people and it's going to be based on a very limited amount of data that is diverse. The majority of that data, a woman who has breast cancer, is going to be based on white women. And so we have to, as a community, recognize we've got to step up and begin to participate as well. And so just to, just to come in, I, I think what the point I was trying to make is that we do need that education, but the right people have to be brought to the table to do it. And that was my point, that we can do it. We are doing it, but the right people have to be brought to the table to educate appropriately, to train appropriately, to have the passion, to have the, the, the skills to do the type of research that you're talking about. That's been the problem. The money has not come to the people who know how to get those things done, yeah. how to educate the yeah. community. The, exactly, the people that they trust. So I'd also add, the black organizations aren't there, mm -hmm. right? So the work you did at Howard was groundbreaking, right? And Howard and Morehouse and Meharry, which are big right. medical research institutions, well, well big relative mm -hmm. for black folks, right? Mm -hmm. When we, when we compare them to the USC's of the world, UCSF's, the Stanford's, NYU's, they just don't compare. And so we have to think about how do we support those organizations because I think, my, I surmise that if they are the holders of the data, right, there will be more trust in those institutions and I think the research questions they might ask will be more relevant for our populations versus, you know, no disrespect to Genentech and USC, they'll just be more inclined to ask more applicable research questions. Yeah. And if they are the holders of the data, Grandma knows Howard, right? Meharry, these are Morehouse, these are household names in our community. So I think that will help. Now, that lift is a pretty big lift for anyone that's worked with a black institution. If you go to church at a black church, I mean, you name it, right? My household, it doesn't matter. You could be small or large. There is a challenge there, but that, I think, has to be part uh, of the answer. Right, and so the National Institutes, of, well, National Cancer Institute, um, just as an example, um, has a program called Comprehensive Partnerships to Advance Cancer Health Equity, or CPACHI, and it was designed specifically to partner um, uh, minority-serving institutions with comprehensive cancer centers to build infrastructure at those minority serving institutions and to work uh, collaboratively, right, particularly to address can uh, cancer health disparities, right, and health equity. Uh, and we just received one of those $16 million grant uh, and it'll be in collaboration with Florida A&M University and the University of Florida uh, to build infrastructure at FAMU, to collaborate with them, to tr have their students come and train in our genomics labs and our precision medicine uh, uh, laboratories, uh, and then be able to take that knowledge back to FAMU and apply it in and, and, and their training education programs and, their, and build their research uh, infrastructure. So we're really excited about those things. So some of these things are starting to come to bear uh, where we can begin to uh, further impact our minority serving institutions, because you're right, that's where, you know, those are the people that we trust. But what about the communities? Because where you find us are oftentimes in a lot of the rural communities where you don't have the large institutions like a Howard, like a Meharry, like a FAMU. So what's the answer in those harder to reach areas but where there's a high incidence of some of these issues? So so for what we're thinking about is the three, B, the three B's. Like in the black community, people get their information from the bishop, like the church, the barbershop, and a beauty salon. So we're, you know, we're saying, how do we educate and get into those spaces so that we can say, we have a prostate cancer study that's ongoing. We have a triple negative breast cancer um, study that's ongoing and we'd like you to participate. So we're starting to engage with different groups that allow us to get into those spaces because to your point, Pharmaceutical companies are not considered the honest broker, right? And so we have to go through different mechanisms to be able to educate people about what we do. We just recently um, started to do some work with Telemundo uh, for Hispanic communities about uh, clinical research. One of the questions that when we talk to some of the Hispanic communities is they think that, you know, 
on, when we, we turn in information to the Department of Justice, to the FBI, to ICE, like if grandma participates in a study, somebody from ICE might show up at the house and get the rest of the family. And so we're thinking about how do we, in, um, on our informed consent documents, how do we say, you know, that information is de identified. We don't turn anything into the government. So really being able to understand what our communities need so that then we can tee up information to them so that they can be, um, they can want to participate. And I think it's also about making sure people are aware of the risks, right? So while data is de-identified, re-identification is a science now, right? So there is an ability in some cases to re-identify. No, we don't want to say that. Right. No, well, I, I think we, we have found that the more upfront you are with folks, they get comfortable, right? So they fundamentally, I think if you can truly explain the risks and benefits of participating to people of color, to black people, they get it. It's when you try to do this hand waving, this sort of secret stuff, that they start hearkening back to, and you know, the the unfolding of Henry and Lax was years, not you know, a handful of years. It's not like 80 years ago; it was recent, right? And so I, I think there is that you can you become trustful when you feel people are being honest and open with you. And <clears throat> to further address uh, Melanie's uh, question about more rural. Uh, areas and particularly how they affect African Americans. I mean, I grew up in Leland, Mississippi, a tiny town surrounded by cotton fields, uh, not too far from Greenville. And uh, uh, for instance, HPV is an, is almost an epidemic proportions there, and cervical cancer. Uh, and the problem is education, right? Now we have Mississippi Valley State University, Jackson State University, Alcorn State University. So I think the training part is huge, the pipeline. Um, being able to train and be students, right, to go back into the communities, right, uh, and build centers for them so that the patient, people can come there to learn and be educated about why, what is HPV, right, why should they know about it, how is it spread, right, and what can we do, because it's preventable. This is a situation where we don't need a pharmaceutical company, right, it's really just, I should, Right. You do I, need I a pharmaceutical that. company. Right, right. Somebody's got to provide yeah, that the HPV vaccine. vaccine. The vaccine, right? The vaccine. But but we could also talk about prevention. Yeah. Right. Right. Safe sex. Right. H abstinence. Right. Whatever whatever that might be. But you're right. I mean, just but but the prevention aspect. Right. That education. There's such a huge lack of education in those areas. Uh, and uh, and and so I mean, as we think about you know diseases and disparities, right, we really also have to continue to consider prevention. And it sometimes tends to get lost, yeah. right? We tend to want to deal with intervention more so than prevention. And I think that that's a way that we can empower ourselves in our own communities, yeah. right, to begin to address and eliminate disparities. Um, you guys touched on this a little bit, but I want to flesh this out just a little bit more because I per my personal opinion is that this has a huge impact on our participation in clinical research, and that is the bias of physicians and practitioners who are treating patients. You know, they're, the patients are presenting with their more acute needs, and so their risk participation in clinical trials is usually like not top of mind for them. What, what would you say about how we can address that and tackle that, that bias among practitioners to encourage their patients to also consider clinical trials? Because that can also help us from an access perspective as well. Absolutely. So the Society of Clinical Research Sites uh, last summer published a white paper that basically says 70 percent of sponsors, so like pharma companies, biotech companies, never ask for a representative population, which means that we're not asking uh, diverse patients to participate in clinical research at the same rate we're asking others. So there are a couple of, of things. One, um, one of the things that we have started to do is Actually, Owen um, spoke to uh, a group of uh, our, at our investigator meeting. Um, he, uh, we had a call with all the investigators, and he shared with them, you know, the work that we're doing on advancing and inclusive research, and that we do want a representative population. So that's one thing sponsors need to say to investigators: we do want a representative population. Um, and I think the the other thing that we can do is. 
Um, patients also need to raise their hand and say, I would be interested um, in a clinical trial because then the physician will say, okay, oh, this person um, is interested, which is why we're really so heavily trying to focus on educating the community about the value of clinical work. And, and I will say that the stats are staggering. 80% of the mortality in breast cancer is, are women of color, yet only 14% of women of color actually participate in clinical research. So while the, even though the death rates are going down, those that do die are women of color, and so we have a grave opportunity right now to ensure that we've got more hand raisers, so I think it works on both sides. It's the investigators saying, and we need more diverse investigators because diverse investigators will more likely have a diverse patient cohort, which then they can ask um, to participate in the, in the clinical research. But also, we need to be encouraging folks um, to ask about clinical, clinical research, and we hardly ever do. And let me echo that point about getting more black doctors, black researchers involved in the research print enterprise and process. Because if you look at black patient, black doctor panels, they are often overrepresented with black patients. I always joke that there's a black pediatrician in, in North Dakota, the eight black people that live in North Dakota are gonna find that person, right? And so, you know, they don't have to go out and recruit, they just look into their waiting rooms and they have that trusting relationship. And some research we just published around the factors that get black men in particular to seek preventative health care we find that there's a, there's a better communication when there's what we call racial concordance, so when there's a black doctor and a black patient, right? Um, and we haven't unpacked what are, the, what are the variables around that, but there's more communication, better communication um, that's related to trust. Um, and then when you, like I said, if you can explain these issues around these really complex studies, um, you get patients engaged and interested. Yeah, I agree, and you know, again, I go back to our hereditary African American hereditary prostate cancer study. You know, I, I had two um, uh, different potential sort of ways or approaches I could have taken. One was I could have gone to the Hopkins people and said, "Let's figure out how how to help you recruit more African Amer American families or 100 African American families," or I could go to the NMA urology section which is you know, about 12 or 13 African, mainly African-American urologists who see 80, 90% African-American men every day in their clinic. Mm -hmm. so, so what was the most efficient or and probably the most effective way for me to get that done? It was to approach the NMA. Not to say that I didn't think that you know, it was important for Bill and Bill Isaacs and his team to you know, figure out you know, how can we improve and, and increasing you know, minority participation in our research studies at Hopkins. Um, and, and we did work with them on some of that. But for me, it was important, right? There was an urgency, right? And working with the NMA was definitely the, the most efficient and effective way to get that study done. So bringing in you know, doctors who, who see patients of color, uh, for me, is really important. And again, it goes back to the whole thing about the training and the education and the pipeline. We have to continue to work on the pipeline. We have to encourage our students to go into medicine and science and STEM, and we need to get them through uh, medical school and graduate school so they can go back into the community and work. I wanted to give the audience uh, one, we have time for one question before we have to wrap up. So does anyone in the audience have a question that's a burning question you want to ask this group of panelists? And I cannot see. <laughs> if you could stand, if you have a question, that would be awesome. Hi, um, Rashida Bob, Bricks Health. Um, I have a few questions, but I'll try to think of the one I'm going to prioritize. <laughs> um, I seems it's a multifaceted problem, multifaceted resources. I'm glad you explained that really well to this room and this audience. Um, I'm really interested in, kind of, to your point. Aside from the pipeline issue, aside from the training of the doctors, any other ways you see maybe the use of technology, um, helping um, people of color, black people connect more? Because honestly, we set the standards for anything in technology, Twitter, Facebook, et cetera. Um, that's a way people find out about clinical trials and also connect tele to telemedicine with their providers. Any good examples of that actually working to maybe reach rural communities, um, communities that might not be as close to academic medical centers? And then, and investigative teams. Rashida, I think that's a perfect question and an awesome way to close out the panel. So if each person could maybe take a couple seconds and sure. answer it, that'd be great. 
So I'll answer it in, in, in two parts. Well, one, we have used um, technology. So if you, so Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram to a certain degree have um, uh, their feeds, right? And they're de-identified, and this is how advertising works. So there's a public conversation around uh, obesity, diabetes, right? We can, they sell that. You can, you can screen for those words and then send advertisements to those um, individuals uh, for research. Um, and we, we, we do that pretty regularly and it's a pretty inexpensive, although somewhat scary um, perspective. Um, the other point I will add is there's also a regulatory component to this, right? So the Food and Drug Administration regulates clinical studies. There currently is, in the U.S., no requirement that a clinical trial be with U.S. patients. So you can do a clinical study in Southeast Asia and submit that to the U.S. for approval. And there's no requirement that there be a diverse representation or diverse sample in your, um, in your research data set. So the regulatory component is also a vehicle um, which can also uh, change this uh, paradigm. We're starting to um, begin to move in, into this direction. We have um, just launched an app for MS, and what, the one thing that I do like about that, it doesn't have any inclusion-exclusion criteria. And in clinical studies, there is a fierce inclusion-exclusion criteria that oftentimes will prohibit diverse people from participating, whether it's based on BMI, it's based on creatinine clearance, it's based on white blood cell counts that are different among the races. But we in the industry have traditionally had um, an inclusion-exclusion criteria based on a white male from 20 years ago. We are trying to make changes to that. Um, but this app that we've got in MS is going to be able to allow us to um, work with patients and understand their symptoms and really begin to, like, not necessarily track people, but be able to provide data insights to them regardless of whether or not they're in the clinical study. And I do think that as we move to this era, where app, apps and other things are going to become more important. Almost all black people I know got a smartphone. So I, I do think this type of application, and it, it's going to be able to provide reminders um, about treatment and, um, and symptoms. So I think these things are going to come. They're still very, very early and in their infancy, though. And then I'll, tr I'll try to be brief. Um, again, I think what's, what's one of the things that we really have to focus on uh, going forward is prevention and I think to me that's where you know technology really you know could play a major role and as we think about the uh, the, the Millennials and I know you don't like being called that um, but the, you know let's let's say 27 to 40 right um, I give you I give you five years after college to do your thing um, but by 27 you really be you should be thinking you know a little bit about your future um, and so I think that 27 to 40, you know, that's when you can really make lifestyle changes uh, that can have a significant impact on your longevity and your health. Um, and, uh, and, and that, you know, is both your life, your livelihood, as well as your finances, right? Because healthcare costs. And so I really think if we could utilize technologies to get the word out on healthy lifestyle and things we can do to prevent uh, chronic diseases like diabetes and uh, uh, hypertension, heart disease, uh, and cancer, uh, the better off we can be. So this is their platform. Social media is their platform. And I really believe that they could use it to empower themselves uh, to begin to look at more prevention, uh, uh, healthier lifestyles for our community and uh, reduction and elimination of some of these disparities. And with that, we have run out of time, but thank you all for sticking around for this engaging panel discussion. I wish we had more time, more of you guys, but thank you guys so much.